Which means that I would like to jump directly into our panel discussion, because what is interesting here is not what I'm talking about, it is what is our members is thinking about the different topics. So I would like to invite Gona, Janne, Tina and Lars up on stage, and then uh, let's continue with the panel discussion. Yes. So we already had a pre-meeting because, as you know, we know each other. So I also said to you guys that this is like a, a get-together since we met in August. So we won't be that formal as the previous panel discussion have been. <laughs> and maybe I will stop you if your answer is too long because we want to uh, take advantage of the minutes that we're having. I know all of you have been speaking. Uh, except you, Tina, but I would like a, a very brief introduction by each of you, uh, who you are, your role, and then what you want to change within this domain when we're talking about the think tank, like what is close to your heart, because I know you have different uh, passion regarding this. So let's start with you, Lars. Thank you. Uh, I'm Lars Blomgaard, and uh, I'm from Denmark. I uh, am working in Dubix as a private security company right now. Previously, I've been in the, the Danish police, where I did uh, digital investigation and, and forensics in regards to all the cybercrime that we see. And in my spare time, I educate um, all newcomers to the field uh, at Copenhagen Business Academy. Um, what I would love to see brought to the field here is actually actionable um, material that you can bring directly home and work with, more or less, out of the, the box. So I would, um, I would love to see that uh, contribution. Yes, thank you yeah. very much, Lars. Gunnar Karlsson. I'm uh, here from uh, Cybercampus Sweden, which is a national organization to get uh, uh, public and, and commercial sector and uh, civil society together, uh, increasing uh, cybersecurity with respect to research, innovation, and education. And I'm leading the educational activities. And uh, close to my heart, or at least close to my worries, uh, uh, is what I'm working on currently, which is to get uh, actual needs for education stated by uh, companies and state agencies. Um, how, because universities can respond to, uh, to the needs, but they have to be stated for us. They have to be articulated. And uh, this is remarkably difficult to get hold of. So that is near to me. Yes. Yes. Uh, hello. I'm uh, Janne Hagen from uh, the University of Oslo. I'm an associate professor there teaching uh, uh, cybersecurity risk uh, management. Um, I also have a long career in critical infrastructure protection and uh, uh, my uh, main concern is actually uh, the vocational education because uh, if we're going to recruit more uh, skilled uh, cybersecurity experts, we need to broaden the, the baseline of recruitment and uh, these people also uh, uh, various positions, uh, and they actually need that kind of competences in their jobs. Yes, thank you very much. And Tina? Hi, my name is Tina. I'm working uh, for Information System Authority, RIA, uh, in Estonia, and I'm expert coordinator. And I'm working on cybersecurity skills topic, and yeah, I'm working it on different levels, uh, right. like making... Uh, right events for youth, so make them excited about cybersecurity, organizing trainings for teachers, uh, doing cooperation with universities, oh, so on, so okay. on. And what's closest to my heart or is that I do see uh, that uh, young people doesn't know about career in cybersecurity, therefore they are not taking any actions coming here. Uh, some of them know, but there's this small portion of youth and Many of them are not ending up here because they have no idea about it. Uh, so I would like to face the situation that young people say like, hey, I don't want to go to cybersecurity because they know what it is. And therefore, we would have more people saying, hey, I like cybersecurity and I will plan my studies or I will plan my after school activities or I will... Uh, change my career towards uh, cybersecurity, but I wanted to be the way that more people make it as a choice, not as life happens. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Tina. And then I also uh, 
got the uh, acceptance that I'm both a moderator but also an active contributor in this panel <laughs> because I'm in it together with you. So close to my heart is that we need to change the narrative about what cybersecurity is. I love the people sitting in here with the cyber battle, but we need to show the society that cybersecurity is much more than the work into the computer. So it goes both into the educational programs, but also in the corporations, telling them cybersecurity is living in all of the units, not only in the security department. So that's very close to my heart. So we have four topics that we're going to cover in uh, 32 minutes. So we have eight minutes to each. So again, we'll try to see if everybody can, can contribute. Um, the first topic is how you think that we will uh, succeed with uh, effectively collaborating across borders. Like, what are the, the key factors for success if, if we're going to succeed with these type of initiatives? I don't know if any one of you want to, to start. What do you think will be important in our work ahead? Um, yeah, I would yes. love to start with that one. Um, actually, what I think would be a beneficial thing is that if I want to go from Denmark to Estonia to study some kind of topic, these points that I can earn here in Estonia, I cannot take them back to Denmark necessarily because that if I have to do that, then it has to be evaluated in the Danish uh, educational system in order to bring these uh, um, points back. So if we can have like an equal level of knowledge an equal level of, of um, education to say, okay, we can transfer that back and forth. And that should be possible for our politicians to have that kind of level defined. So that, that if we can have that, we have gone a long way. And I know you're a very strong advocate for that, Lars. So yes. I know that we're going to at least <laughs> succeed with pushing some doors. Yes, Connor? <clears throat> we are fortunate that these countries that are collaborating are very similar in many respects, highly digitalized, uh, well-functioning education sector and so forth. So I think um, sharing experience is meaningful. Um, sharing with countries which are very different uh, experience are not necessarily meaningful, but here they are. And um, I, I think we, we, we basically have to get started on that. I, I, I think the, the, the thresholds uh, are exist, like, like, like a credit transfer and so forth, but uh, uh, mostly is the, the the mechanisms and the and the procedures for doing it. Um, so I think, for instance, uh, could we compile uh, what I said uh, lists of of uh, needs for courses and training opportunities in Sweden? They're probably quite similar to uh, opportunities in in Denmark. Or if so, sharing that intelligence data, which is very difficult to get by uh, today, would be a very good start. Yes. Yes, um, I think that uh, um, having a more uh, use of guest lecturing from the other Nordic countries, it's, uh, you cannot underestimate what personal relations means to collaboration when, when it comes to the practical side. So uh, using more uh, uh, guest lecturing from various uh, Nordic countries, and uh, it should actually not be a problem when you can have the uh, speech on Zoom or you can meet virtually. So that's one, one yeah. example. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really important, like this uh, format as well, as think tank, that we get to know people on other countries who to call as if you want to have quest lecture or so on. And other formats as well, like uh, let's put together specialists who are working similar things in different countries together, another format for another kind of specialists to have them. For example, we just issued as RIA uh, one booklet for schools, which was actually developed in Finland. But our experts were having a meeting together with experts in Finland and they showed that and they were like, oh, that's really good. We want to have this in Estonia as well. So this material was translated and this is something that we don't have to do everything. Every work doesn't have to be made in a way that everyone is inventing the wheel, but we can share what we have done and maybe you help out with this one and we can help you out with this one. And I was part of the European cybersecurity competition uh, last month in uh, Italy and it was really nice to see that actually those people who are putting the, together the national teams are actually working together as well. Hey, we are making a qualification round for our country. If you want, you can join, like send 20, 30 people from your country as well. It can be training for them. Like, let's be open for different kind of opportunities and be like uh, friends who are sharing uh, what they have with each other. So I think you're addressing 
<laughs> the very uh, critical part is that we need to knowledge share with friends, people we know, people we trust. But why is that so difficult? Why haven't it happened yet? What, what, what is the biggest obstacle for, for actually realizing this? I know that we're starting on it, but... Yeah. I don't, I don't see um, any uh, major obstacles. Uh, there will be practicalities, but I think the motivation has not been there before. So I think uh, starting from the motivation now to do something, um, but I, I, I cannot imagine any, any major difficulties. I actually have, I can share my personal experience. I, uh, my background is in the field of education. So I used to work in schools, in Ministry of Education, and doing other other stuff in the field of, of education. So when I came to work the position I'm working currently, I didn't have any connections in cybersecurity domain. So it was really difficult for me the like first half a year to like call people like, hey, I'm doing this, uh, can we meet up or so? But uh, during these two and a half years, I have built a community where I feel comfortable like calling people. And so maybe it's, uh, helps if uh, you're a new people in the domain and somebody guides you and tells you like, hey, we have a good connection there, let's go together. So if you have a new colleague or somebody who doesn't have this community yet, it helps if you are uh, taking their hand and uh, bringing them to the places and showing them to people. Luckily, I had this team who helped me a lot, but this might be as well if we are talking about this, uh, we need these personal contacts who can help us so that we can share our community with the ones who are yet starting in this field. Mm -hmm. And now, Gona, you said you think the motivation is here now. What have happened since it's there now? Has there anything societal? Yeah, a sense of urgency that, mm. that uh, we have problems to, to face up to. I think it's simply that. Also with political recognition of that, at least in Sweden. Um, I mean, we, we, Sweden was supposed to be neutral until... Uh, two months after uh, uh, the, the Russia invaded the Ukraine, and then now we're a NATO member, which was unforeseen for, for, for since, the, since ever. So, um, so things change very rapidly um, when, when, when the sense of urgency comes. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, we are fortunate in this field. There are other fields, perhaps, where, where they cannot uh, point to, to stronger motivation, but, but in our field we can, and I think uh, we should we should use that. We have to meet up to the expectations also, because motivation is also uh, follows by a lot of expectation on us to deliver something. Yes, agree. And Jana? Uh, I think that when it comes to the universities, there are already funding schemes and uh, established relations across uh, Nordic and Baltic uh, countries. But when, when, you, when you look into vocational education, and uh, remember that, uh, for instance, Norway is not that big country, actually, 5.5 millions, but the population is spread all the way over the country and in the uh, r rural uh, areas. Uh, they uh, maybe have mo most uh, employees coming from the vocational education. So. Uh, there is no funding schemas uh, that actually enables that kind of uh, collaboration. Uh, also, when it comes to uh, teacher reserves, when, uh, when uh, somebody is leaving the job for a, a temporary uh, time. So uh, th that's where uh, I think uh, we should also uh, focus on the education. There is a lot of young people that actually do not go to the university. Yes, and I know we also discussed it in August, the thing with, if we're going all of the members together uh, and all of us with the voice saying like, we need better structures also for funding, for educational material across countries, uh, maybe we can talk a bit louder. Uh, and I think all, some of you also said the thing that we are anchored under the Nordic Council Minister. Hopefully, we can make a positive impact here. Yes. And then, if we take the second part, uh, we have talked a lot about the industry partnerships. That when we're talking about cybersecurity, it's all about fixing challenges in the real world. We're talking about a threat landscape that is changing every day. We need to have a partnership with the industry so we are understanding what is happening there. Could you give some insights to the audience on what challenges are there now uh, in terms of su successful uh, partnership with the industry and what would be the ambition for the future? Like, How can we fix it? I know it's not an easy one to fix, but... <laughs> 
if I may start yes. on that. Um, I know that we have in Denmark the initiative called Cyber Skills, where we can get all the young people to meet the companies out there. And the thing I've personally encountered is that there's a lot of questions from the youngsters that when they arrive in the cybersecurity industry, they have a lot of questions in order to what and how do we fit into to this picture. And then if they should be part of that, then we as old timers should also invite these young people in to say, okay, what are the requirements that we see as, as long as you got the, um, the desire and um, a, a good team player, then you're also set to go. Because if, if they have that, then we in, in the security industry and also in the private sector can build uh, realism into the classrooms. And that is also what you said, that there lacks some kind of realism. Because uh, all the young people, they don't know what they are working with. You can go into a lot of these different websites and, and learn different things but you cannot put the puzzles together. So I think that is what we can uh, contribute with. And we have seen, um, I would say, several successful uh, collaborations, in, in Denmark at least, because we have helped in, in that sense. Yes, and Kona? Um, I also uh, think that we have to put uh, demands on the, on the industry side and also public agencies which are hiring in this area. Um, they have to understand that, that the skills shortage will not be solved by uh, increasing undergraduate and graduate programs. Uh, in Sweden, we have expanded a lot, and, and it's mainly shortage of applicants at this point. Also, um, the throughput is not great. About half of the students enrolling uh, do not graduate. Um, they may be skilled enough to get a job, but when companies say you need a master's degree and five years work experience mm -hmm. and they're not providing that work experience, I mean, they are creating their own skill shortage or so. Uh, they have to provide training opportunities. They have to see that people can be skilled without having a, a degree. Um, so, um, and at, at university, we, we can provide tests. I mean, we have examination for everything. So, so we could put them up as tests. If they, if they have uh, someone who, who has uh, dropped out of, of, uh, of education and they want to, to vet that person, well, come to university and, and, and get the test for, for that, that particular person, right? You have to pay for it, but, but uh, money is usually not the problem. So, so that it, I, they, they have to be realistic and they also to, to contribute something in order to get the this, this skills addressed. And in some areas, not even engineering, is, is, uh, which is, is, is undersupplied, is maybe necessarily background. Maybe people from social sciences trained, as, as uh, Janne said, in, with, with the professional training, which could be a semester or a year of, of cybersecurity, might, might bring them the best expertise for the areas they have. So, uh, and uh, as I mentioned before, which, which is, is, is very close to, to the problems I'm, I'm working with, uh, they have to also to articulate their demands. If they need professional training for their staff, what is that? You cannot just say cybersecurity, because that's a, just a field, that's not a, a course title. And when you get down to, 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 to levels, you have to say, for what category, what background do they have, uh, how much volume, how much work time will they put aside? Is, right? but, but now you need, or are you saying we need to put pressure, but is it because the companies are lacking the knowledge on being able to specify it? Yes, but, but, but in that case, there has, they can initiate, I mean, they have to do the ground. What are the work tasks that they cannot staff, right? If you work from the tasks forward, you can probably see what type of, of, of skill set you need in a person. Uh, we cannot do that for them. I mean, and everyone has to recognize we have an uh, economy to deal with at universities also. And these are products. Courses are our products. And you cannot blindly develop products for a market where the market is undefined as it is right now. Mm. So, so, so industry also have to step up. We, we can do a lot of things, but, but, but there has to be a counterpart also that, that uh, comes with their information to us. Mm. But maybe just before you, uh, Tina and Janet, to stick to the question. And I can ask you last because you're representing the industry. I think we're experiencing companies who do not know what is the cybersecurity profile working with. So we mm. see job positions yep, yep. where they need to handle governance, risk, and compliance yep. while yep. being a pen tester. And I yep. think people in the industry will know yep. that is not yep. doable. Yep. So what is your, from an industry perspective, do we need to train companies as well? Or Yes. Uh, I mean, they have to be a little bit more clear in, in what they actually need mm -hmm. because that's, that's the problem. And uh, one of the things I've also encountered myself is that uh, if, if the companies out there, they want to have different skill set, 
they have to define it and be very specific because then they can feed that back to the universities and say, okay, what do we need to acquire in, in, in the future? But again, there are, it's important to understand there are different levels of uh, the, uh, the needs out there in, the co in businesses, mm -hmm. especially in Denmark, where the diversity of, of uh, companies are very, very big. Mm -hmm. You have the small companies, which we have the majority of, and then you have the large companies that is only a, a few uh, on a handful. So the level there has to be defined. And, and again, but, but the companies out there, especially mid-level to high level, has to be defined what are our needs in, in that sense. Mm -hmm. Yes, and then Tina? Actually, what Anita has been working on a couple of last years is to develop the cybersecurity cyber skills framework mm -hmm. to help SMEs to actually define uh, what they need and what kind of job this uh, kind of pro people do usually. Mm. But what Gunnar said about uh, being uh, able for young people to go to companies, this is what we see here in Estonia as well, that people especially studying in vocational educational institutions, but also in uh, universities sometimes struggling to find an uh, internship place in s cyber security. Mm -hmm. It's easier in IT in general, but if you want to do internship in cyber security, it's, it's really, really difficult. And uh, companies saying we do need a people, but they're looking for like people who are trained, who have experience, like five years experience, like you said, but they are not willing to take so easily uh, to people who have just graduated, but we have to, somebody has to take them in, in a way so that we will get those people with experience. And this is something that Estonia is now trying uh, with an internship program uh, for public companies, but I think private companies should do more of that. Yeah, Jana, did you have something before? Because then yes, um, I was thinking about uh, well, at the University of Oslo, we we do not uh, see that kind of uh, lacking collaboration. Not uh, from from my perspective, uh, like Cisco provide uh, uh, materials and uh, courses for students, but you have to pay. So budget is one issue. A budget should never be uh, forgotten in uh, any discussion. I think it's a very and, important And the final, <laughs> final point is uh, talking about internship and so. In the practical life, uh, most SMEs, they outsource IT operations. So uh, if you want the uh, internship, you have to go to the vendors mm -hmm. to get that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Gona, you yeah, I just wanted comment? to uh, mention um, uh, a way we try to address the, the problem of uh, getting needs. So we ran, when we set up the Cyber Campus Sweden, we, we ran workshops on education. And uh, we, we, we got some answers, indicative answers, but, but not anything that we could start developing uh, uh, courses for professional training. So we put together the best ideas we had, and we made a fictitious course brochure. You can find it on Cyber Campus Sweden. It's called Agile Education Imagined, where we tried to be, do a realistic offering but it didn't cost us more than the production of this brochure, uh, but anything in there could de develop. So if a company comes and says, we like this course, uh, we could order 20 positions per year for three years, then we would develop that. Um, so trying to make it as concrete as possible, it states all the parameters that we need to develop it uh, that I mentioned. So, so um, this is also for you to use in dialogue with uh, companies, you could say, Let's start discussing from here because it's it as concrete as a real course brochure would be. I think that's a very good perspective on it. And I also think when we're talking about internships, what we see in Denmark is that consultancy companies like Dubex, uh, et cetera, they can recruit juniors mm. because they have a lot of tasks to be solved mm -hmm. and they can start on, on junior tasks, et cetera. But we experience in the companies where we are solving pressing issues, it's simply two small teams to take in an intern, that, that the resources are not there, and we need to try to see if we can address that in, in, in some way and, and maybe help the companies take on juniors and, and identify how they can provide value. But also that, that demands something of the culture from that uh, company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At Dubex, where I work, is very built in. It's a prerequisite. When I start working there, you know, I mean, you have to work together. That's part of the teamwork, and that's a very important part of it. I've also seen companies, I've also been in companies where that time is not there. So if an intern arrives, then they are, most, they are left on their own. Mm -hmm. 
mm. and that is uh, one of the big problems. And, and if you can do a collaboration with what Gunnar says here, I think that would also be a, a very good step. But the intern also have to learn from that company and be able to, to fulfill some assignments there. So, so that's very important. Mm. And there is some gaps between there that, that could be bridged somehow. I know this is one of the points that we discussed uh, back in August, that trying to see if we can develop some kind of guideline or material to companies in terms of getting these uh, interns or, or youngsters on, on board. So again, I think this just highlights how the collaboration across borders makes sense, that we get inspired by what you have done, Gunnar, and, and can look into that. So th this is where it actually makes sense that we're doing this. Mm -hmm. Then the next topic is early education and community initiatives. And I know it's... A lot of you, it's very close to your heart that we need to do something when we're talking about early education, but also community initiatives that is, uh, what do you say, outside school time uh, that you could go to if, if it's your interest. What is your experience with existing initiatives in your countries? And also, why is it that it plays such a big role? Why is it such an important topic for us to address? Do any of you want to start? I can start. Yeah. <laughs> I think with all those cybersecurity and young uh, actions, we sometimes, it needs clearer uh, distinction. Like, do we, is it awareness raising or is it somebody, something what will guide those young people towards career in cybersecurity? Because this will say what kind of topics are we going to discover here? And uh, what I've seen, we do have some uh, awareness raising things, but they sh should be more like, spread out evenly to different places. In Estonia, currently, it depends a lot from what kind of teachers are working in school. Do they know about cybersecurity? Can they talk it to their students? Can they help students with simple problems that students are facing? Or is it something that the school has nobody who has this uh, knowledge and can raise their awareness? And also, if you're talking about uh, computer science lessons in Estonia, it's not compulsory. Some schools do it, some schools don't. But what we have seen also is that teachers do not know about working in cybersecurity. What is something when they are talking about their students with cybersecurity, what it is that we should talk about it. And that's uh, something what we actually did in Estonia in this fall. We did uh, train the trainers kind of program for uh, computer science teachers. And we actually saw that there is really big demand for that. Our registration was full less than 20 hours. It was really fast uh, registration. So we saw that this is something we should address more. and. Uh, we made it in different regions uh, so that the pe teachers who are usually left out because it's far, they're working in the rural areas, would get actually access to these trainings uh, as well. And I think with when we are talking about uh, young people themselves, they need a feel of community. Everybody wants to belong somewhere. And uh, when you can go to places and... Uh, solve CTFs like those guys are doing here and goes uh, together, then it's fun for you. You want to do it. You want to be part of that. And also, can we give those options to those who don't want to compete? Uh, so I think we need really diverse kind of places for young people to go. And we need that those people who are working with young people actually have this knowledge. Everybody doesn't have to have this knowledge how uh, to speak about cybersecurity with young people. But every young people should have somebody in their life who can talk to them uh, what is working in cybersecurity and what you should know and do in your computer, in your smartphone uh, mm -hmm. to protect yourselves. Yes, and maybe just to supplement. So in this room next to us, uh, a lot of the different countries are sitting there. And we have a Danish team where, at least I know three of them, we have had in our local Danish community for the last uh, six years. Uh, I know one of the guys, when he first met to our first activity six years ago, he didn't know anyone of the people in the community, but he just said, I really think cybersecurity is, is awesome. I want to learn more, but none of the people in my class or school shares the same interest. So the fact that he met a community that uh, embraced him and said, OK, you want to learn more? Here, here is the plate. You just dig in and we'll help you along the way. And now he has been on the national team for the last three years. What is important here is that it's super, it's not super, but it is expensive to have, to have and run and mobilize physical cybersecurity communities. But the value of having these guys in there that will be in the top if of the technical talents, then the value uh, is equal. But it is time consuming and it needs funding, uh, but it's indeed valuable. 
Um, I have not directly worked with uh, younger pupils, uh, uh, so um, my take is probably more from my own children and, and, and so forth. But um, don't make it into a course. Don't make it into uh, formal education. We know that school can kill off any interest whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, make it into a hobby activity. Make it into something which is outside school. This is a break from school. It's fun. Um, also, this format here is great, but we need to other formats, maybe more emphasizing creativity and, and, and skills or um, dramatic skills, writing skills. Um, so it's broader than, than just hacking. Um, um, because that, that, that's one area of it, but, but we need to address the whole. But, but uh, not making it formal, uh, this is, is my main point. Jan, very happy that you say that because I disagree. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we, had a, a pi we, had, we run several pilots in Norway. We looked to the US and Gen Cyber. And we had uh, American teachers teaching the Norwegian teachers, and we made a full week program. We had uh, p uh, the police, uh, various governmental agencies, and uh, people from the comp uh, IT companies. They came and uh, provided lecturing for uh, vocational uh, level students a whole week. I was there talking about critical infrastructure protection. Nobody slept. Mm -hmm. Nobody slept. And on a score one to four to five, on a on a, a score, we got a four, which is very good. And uh, we made also a small diploma. And uh, some of these uh, students, they uh, they were they came next year and they told us that I got that job just because of this diploma. I was <laughs> the only one that actually knew something about cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. But then I goes back to to you that cybersecurity is, well, it's much, much more than just what's going on in the next room here. What's going on in the next room is actually a lagging activity. It's too late when you have to do the pen test after mm -hmm. the products are developed. Th there should be more focused on secure software development and also on risk management and all these soft uh, topics, social science uh, stuff. Yeah, and last? Well, I can come with uh, several examples in Denmark where we have initiatives. Uh, if we start from the very beginning, young people at the age of 6 to si uh, 17, mm -hmm. we have had uh, or have um, Coding Pirates, which is uh, an initiative where young people can get together, and that is uh, free of charge. Depends on where you are. Someone charge a little bit of money for it, for, for keeping it running. Um, but, but getting money and f funding for that is fairly easy because a lot of companies out there, they want to put funding into young people. Mm -hmm. So that is very easy. When you get a little bit more up the ladder, so you get um, at, at the communities, at um, cyber skills, as we have talked about, but also at these um, uh, the cyber uh, team we have here, then there is it's driven by uh, the few people. And I think... This actually, especially coding pirates, can spark off some initiatives also across the Baltics because it's created by one guy. He went on DTU, which is the, the Danish uh, Technical University, and he thought, we're missing out on this. So he created just like a little forum with you know, some other um, younger guys that could come in there, or, or, and girls especially also. And then you know, the kids came in, looked at coding, looked at robots, looked at web pages, all the things that got their interest. So it's, it was not a course. It was just, what do you want to learn, actually? Mm -hmm. So that collaboration sparked off that you have old timers like me that coming in and support the young kids. And that actually creates a lot of fun uh, ideas. And, and also the robots that is uh, going on out there. That is what they learn when they attend these um, collaborations, mm -hmm. I would rather say. And I was like, I kind of agree with you, Janet, that there needs to be something that is like uh, equal math and yeah. uh, English or whatever, etc. These uh, elementary courses where they are taught something about cyber awareness. But the 
where they're really diving into the interest needs to be outside school. So I kind of agree with both of you. Tina? I kind of agree and disagree at the same time. <laughs> uh, what do you define as a course? What you describe as a course is something similar we did in Cyber Research Camp that we are putting the kids together. We have actually like a plan for them for the week, but we do have some fun activities afternoon as well. Mm. So it's, you can say it's not a course because for the kids it's a camp, but me as a planner, I do see I have a course like, like between that. And at the same time, uh, CTF Tech, who is organizing this CTF uh, competition, had actually girls uh, kind of course, online course, uh, and also uh, students get uh, credit points for that. And they can use those credit points afterwards if they're coming to university. And it was uh, when they made a questionnaire about it, it was actually one of the selling points for the participants that if I go to this course, uh, it, this will help me afterwards in my university life. So it can be important as well that it is a formal course. So I think it depends what age group are we talking about it mm -hmm. and how are we putting the package on around that course. Because if you're planning, it can be course, but you can sell it like something different. And it's a design of a project. And a very short comment to that. Yeah, yeah. the point is to make uh, the course for the school very relevant. According, if you are mechanical or uh, electrical engineering, it must be very relevant to the kind of study you have. And I fully agree that uh, 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 volunteer uh, work means a lot. Look at soccer, or a, a, not American, but uh, football in Europe. Uh, how many kids doesn't play football? And look at the uh, international level also for girls. Agree on that. And Lars? Well, when you talk about a course, that is usually something that uh, people think of. There is like a, a list that we have to go through, then there is a lot of requirements, and then you get an exam that can actually scare off people. Mm. So if you have, as you mentioned there, like an agenda, that's fine. Mm. And then you also have something that they can form themselves. I think that actually sparks off a lot of initiatives because um, if you give them all the ideas, then they can start thinking on that and form their own ideas and bring that to the mix. I think that is a very important uh, point that you have there. And I think with that said, Lars, I hope that the audience and the one listening in can see that we're here we have four out of 40 members who have an opinion on what, what needs to be done and, and what is important to address. But I think this illustrates why we need to gather people from all of the Nordic Baltic countries, use their experience, use their insights into what format have worked well in the different areas, learn from each other, maybe even copy formats, uh, be inspired as, as, uh, as far as we can, and potentially also do collaborative projects together in the future. And as I said to begin with in the presentation, that success, successful executed projects is built on trust and uh, good collaboration across people. And when we, when you know each other, as we do now, uh, we have a much better foundation. So I think these four and the rest of the 36 members uh, deserves a really big applause because they're investing their time, uh, contributing with the knowledge because they want to make a difference for all of the Nordic and Baltic countries. Thank you very much, all four of you. Thank you for organizing it. Thank you. Thank you.